God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. Many believe that this line, penned by the great late 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, challenges the foundations of traditional beliefs and opened the door to modern existential thought. But what if this void Nietzsche spoke of has actually set the stage for the next great leap in our existential understanding? What if, in this era where technology meets quantum theory, we find a new kind of immortality? Not through deities or spiritual realms, but through the very fabric of the universe and our mind's interaction with it. Quantum consciousness. Quantum immortality. These are not just fancy terms. They're gateways to understanding the deepest mysteries of existence. They challenge us to reimagine what it means to live, to die, and to exist beyond the conventional boundaries. Are we truly mortal? Or is there a continuum of consciousness that defines the finality of death? This is what we're about to explore. So prepare yourself to question everything you know about life and death, because this is a deep one. Are you ready? Let's begin. In the storied halls of Oxford University, among the echo of ancient scholars and the rustle of falling leaves, Roger Penrose, a man driven by a relentless quest for understanding, contemplated the enigmas of the universe. Penrose, a mathematical physicist with a formidable intellect, had long been fascinated by the foundational elements of reality and the elusive nature of human consciousness. His academic pedigree was impeccable, and his mind was a crucible for revolutionary ideas that challenged the very fabric of understanding. Across the ocean, in the expanse of Arizona, Stuart Hameroff served as an anesthesiologist routinely crossing the delicate thresholds of consciousness with his patients. Hameroff was captivated not just by the mechanics of anesthesia, but by the profound question of what consciousness itself entailed. His daily encounters with the waking and the unconscious fueled a massive interest in the deep mysteries of the mind. Putting people into a state of unconsciousness only to observe them as they awoke and then falling oneself into a world of questions. But how does a doctor in Arizona get to build a theory of the mind with a great scientist at Oxford? It's an exciting pairing and it proves that anyone with a fascination can build a bridge to some of the greatest minds in the world. The paths of these two distinct men did indeed converge through their shared fascination with one of science's greatest puzzles. The three shells and Demolition Man? <laughs> no, although that is still a mystery. Anyway, Penrose, with his mathematical insights into the cosmos, had reached a critical impasse in explaining the phenomenon of consciousness through conventional physics, and was eager to explore the quantum realm. Hameroff, grounded in the practical realities of medicine, yet speculative about the role of micro-level biology and consciousness, was searching for a theoretical framework that could bridge his observations with the broader questions of mind science. Their pivotal meeting was almost cinematic, set against the backdrop of an international conference on the physics of consciousness, where thinkers from diverse disciplines gathered to probe the mysteries of the mind. Penrose presented his radical ideas about the possible relationships between the quantum world and the neurological processes. Hameroff, attending the same conference, approached Penrose with his own observations about microtubules, tiny tubular structures within neurons that he suspected could play a crucial role in brain function. Micro tubby what now? Microtubules are tiny structures within some cells, but most importantly for this explanation they are found inside neurons, which are human brain cells. These microtubules are fundamental in helping brain cells transport materials and adapt to new information, which are all essential for the brain to work. They support the cells, they help the cells with growth and repair, and they assist the cells with the transport of nutrients and chemical messages. Working tirelessly, they developed the Orchestrated Objective Reduction, ORCH-OR, 
theory, suggesting that consciousness arises from quantum vibrations in microtubules within brain neurons. This process, they proposed, was orchestrated by synaptic and other neurological processes and involved a form of quantum computation that was significantly different from anything previously proposed in science. Did they conclude that they believed the microtubbies were in fact teleportation chambers for the observing mind? They didn't. But it does make me wonder exactly what happens when you bring superpositioning into the equation. Diving into quantum consciousness, we find that quantum processes like superpositioning, entanglement and tunneling operate on principles very different from everyday physics. These could explain some brain activities in ways traditional neuroscience doesn't yet fully grasp. Take superpositioning, for example, where particles can exist in multiple states at once until measured. In our minds, this might mean we hold several possible thoughts or feelings until one becomes dominant. This could help us understand the fluid, changeable nature of our consciousness. Then we have entanglement, and this might explain how different parts of our brain work together seamlessly. It suggests that particles, no matter how far apart, can be interconnected, potentially allowing instant coordination across the brain. Quantum tunneling involves particles passing through barriers that seem impossible to penetrate, so this might be similar to how our brains tackle difficult problems, discovering solutions that appear to bend the rules of critical thinking. <laughs> Perhaps I only read rather superficially, which is true. But I didn't know about microtubules. Stuart, I think one of the things he was impressed him about them is that when you see pictures of mitosis, that's a cell dividing, and you see all the chromosomes, and the chromosomes get they get all get lined up and then they get pulled apart. And so that as the cell divides, the half the chromosomes go, you know, how they well, they divide into the two parts. And they go two different ways. And what is it that's pulling them apart? Well, those are these little things called microtubules. And so he started to get interested in them. And he formed the view, well, he was, had his day job or night job or whatever you call it, is to put people to sleep, mm -hmm. except he doesn't like calling to sleep because it's different. General anesthetics mm -hmm. in a reversible way. So you want to make sure that they don't experience the pain that would otherwise be something that they feel and consciousness is turned off for a while and it can be turned back on again so it's crucial that you can turn it off and turn it on and what do you do when you're doing that what do general anesthetic gases do and see he formed the view that it's the microtubules that they affect uploading uh into an alternative medium of your mind of your consciousness into some other medium is possible a, if we know what that what consciousness is, what that process is, and and B, we have a, an appropriate medium. So if it's quantum computations in microtubules, then it could be transferred into a medium of microtubules or some other entity like fullerenes, which could do the same sort of thing as long as we have a space of process. Quantum consciousness not only challenges our scientific views, but could lead to new technologies that interact with our thoughts in revolutionary ways, potentially enhancing brain function or even replacing human consciousness in machines. As this field expands, it also raises profound ethical questions about the implications of manipulating or enhancing consciousness. These are vital discussions as we venture further into understanding the quantum nature of our being, rethinking everything from physics to philosophy, and redefining our place in the cosmos. But this isn't a theoretical science channel, is it? No. This is a uh, existential, philosophical, mind-bendery, psychedelic, chrononaut, UFO, UAP, alien, multidimensional, phantasmatismo channel on Eutulius Maximus. Exactly. Which leads me to our third act. And the one I know you've been really excited to dive into, Wilfred. Strap in, Profundiums. This one is gnarly.
Maybe each human being lives in a unique world, a private world different from those inhabited and experienced by all other humans. If reality differs from person to person, can we speak of reality singular? Or shouldn't we really be talking about plural realities? And if there are plural realities, are some more true, more real than others? Philip K. Dick. Imagine in the next few decades, your life is filled with miraculous close calls. But no matter what happens, you just keep on living. Now let's take it a step further. What if I told you that at each of these critical moments, instead of dying, your consciousness flickers into a parallel universe where you always survive, completely unaware, carrying on as usual, effectively living forever, at least from your own perspective. Sounds like something out of a Philip K. Dick novel? Well, believe it or not, a thought experiment connected to the work of Hugh Everett and his work in the 1950s formed part of the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. Everett proposed that all possible outcomes of quantum measurements are physically realized, each in a different world or branch of the universe. Quantum immortality extends Everett's idea to suggest that a person could continue to exist in a universe in which they have not died, essentially living forever from their own perspective. I'm nearly 300 years old. A mortality for me was a project of my own fruition. We as neo-humans and the transhumans living together as one forever. I thought you said in the second dimension the transhumans and the neo-humans were at war with one another. That is true, but it's more of a tepid sort of war. Aside from the occasional ion bombing on military infrastructure or the citizen registration centres, it's actually all about who can live forever. So far, the two frontrunners are FM2030, the world's first transhuman, he's real, look him up, who is currently the president of Civitas Town and the TMP, respectively a city-state and political wing that only caters for transhumans, augmented individuals hell-bent on achieving immortality. And then there's me, Wilfred Cannon. CEO of Talon Corp, neo-human, maniacal genius, founder of the League of Patriots, creator of the Civitas idea, and... What? Friend of Captain Solo. As an analogy, one can imagine an intelligent amoeba with a good memory. As time progresses, the amoeba is constantly splitting, each time the resulting amoeba is having the same memories as the parent. Our amoeba, hence, does not have a lifeline, but a life tree. Whoever at the third. As we peel back the layers of reality, the quantum threads woven into the tapestry of consciousness beckon us to explore a cosmos more intricate and interconnected than we ever imagined. But now, let me take a moment to be candid. I mean, let's just be subjective for this last part of the video. Okay, everything aside, what is all of this? If this reality is possible, then what on earth is going on? What's driving it? What's driving it to create it and power it? These ideas might be out there, but the closer you get to the quantum level, everything starts to become really weird. None of this makes sense. So before you dismiss any of what I've said today, know one thing, nobody knows the answers to anything. We can observe stuff happening and create something itself just by observing it. The quantum prisoners of our own design. Maybe. Well, if that's the case, then potentially anything is possible. So the next time you think of something, I want you to ask yourself, where is this thought coming from? And if the universe works by seeing something into reality, then how powerful actually is a thought? Perhaps you could dream something into reality. So be specific on your dreams and challenge the universe to deliver them. The quantum universe is calling to us, James. It calls to all of us because perhaps it is us. Thank you for joining me on this deep dive yet again. I'm James, and this is my buddy, the extra-dimensional, semi-cryogenically frozen, 300-year-old ex-president of Civitas Nihilium, Wilfred Talon. CEO of Talon Corp. Until next time, 
keep questioning, keep exploring, and above all, keep dreaming of better worlds. If you'd like to support me on this journey, I've created a small Patreon where, for a cost of a cup of tea, you can help me monthly or purchase the digital version of my second game in the existential gaming series that is the Civitas Universe, titled The Mysteries of Profundum. It's a text adventure RPG for the 21st century. It's on Windows PC, and it takes a deep dive into the second dimension. Well, you'll find me. Patreon members can get early access to all of my videos and help me to really push forward in making this channel a thing. If you are new to the channel, I release videos like this every Wednesday. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe, Profundiums. Exactly. SS to the mushy, and know that all of you are epic and rad. Take your brain to another dimension. Play close attention. See you next time.